Shalom Church! The month of August was named after the first Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus. Did you know that his reign was marked by two centuries of Pax Romana, which means Roman peace? May we not only experience peace every Sunday, but true shalom that only comes from God. Let us read from Isaiah chapter 40 verse 20 to 31. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 to 31 Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, you are a holy God and we praise you for being faithful to us. Forgive us, Father God, for being prideful and for not obeying your commands most of the time. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us from our sins, for continuing to bless us and for giving us hope beyond our troubles. Lord, we just want to pray for all those who are battling in the hospital right now. We lift up to you those who are experiencing with the f issues with the family, financial, relationships, health, and spiritual battles. May your presence be with us always. Continue to protect us from the virus and from uh, the enemy. Fill us with the Holy Spirit as we listen to your message this morning. Remove in us all negative thoughts and emotions that may hinder us from worshiping you today. Guide our speaker as he delivers your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 to 17. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by Him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for the evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Our message is entitled, Being a Living Testimony for Jesus. Let us all welcome Pastor Ken Santosidad. During the Japanese occupation of the Philippines in 1942, a Christian family was imprisoned by the Japanese soldiers. Herb and Ruth Klingen and their young son suffered for three years under the hand of the Imperial Japanese soldiers. The prisoners were tortured, killed, and starved. One of the most hated and feared commandants is Konishi. Konishi, near the end of the war, found a way to severely torture the prisoners. Klingen narrated that Konishi increased the food ration but gave them palay, the unhusked rice, to eat. Eating rice with its razor-sharp outer shell would cause intestinal bleeding that would kill them in hours. It was a death sentence for all the prisoners. But God spared the life of the Klingons and of others. And in February of 1945, the Klingons and others were freed. After a few years, the Klingons learned that Konishi is working or has been found working in Manila Golf Course as a groundskeeper. He was put on trial for his war crimes and later on hanged. But before his execution, he professed conversion to Christianity saying he had been deeply affected by the testimony of the Christian family he had persecuted. God used the Klingon's testimony to save a once murderer, torturer, and atheist like Konishi. It was a great story of how, a power, of how powerful a good testimony to others can be. Like the Christians in the Asia Minor whom Peter wrote the first Peter to, they were also experiencing persecutions and struggles. But Peter urged them to live 
a life that will glorify God and that will draw people to Christ. The title of our message today is Being a Living Testimony for Jesus. And our passage is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 17. You know how we live our lives, react to crisis, and respond to criticism and persecution? And how we submit to the government leaders conveys a message to the people around us. We communicate to them who we are as Christ followers and who Jesus is. And the question I want us to ponder on and answer is this. Is our life drawing people to the Lord or away from the Lord? Our main idea is this. Christians are called to live a life that will glorify God and will point people to Christ. But how can we do that? There are three important commands from our passage today on how we should live a life that will glorify God and point people to Christ. First, we should develop a life of holiness. And it says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Do you know someone who was, who was born and raised here in the Philippines and later on moved to another country, migrated to another country? Once that person migrates, he slowly adapts to the new environment, the language, the way of life, the worldview of that country. But as you can notice, even though a migrant gets a new citizenship and is living in his new home, you can still determine where that person came from. He still speaks his mother tongue. Uh, he still craves for the food where he came from, right? Uh, you can see that although he, was an, he has a new environment, a new citizenship, his former way of life is still manifesting in his thoughts, speech, actions, and cravings. Christian life can be likened to that of a migrant who was given a new citizenship. We were born sinners and used to live in this sinful world our thoughts feelings actions and desires are shaped by this fallen world and thus we have the tendency to still commit the sins we used to do when we were not christians yet that is why peter urged the believers to abstain from the passions of the flesh if you will notice peter addressed them as beloved reminding them that they are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for his own possession. They are no longer slaves of sin. They are no longer followers of Satan. They are now God's beloved children, citizen of his kingdom. And he said, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. You know, the word abstain implies the ability to run from, to flee, to, to restrain from doing. Someone who is a slave to sin cannot abstain from sinning. But a true Christian can abstain from sinning because it is God himself who liberated us from the bondage of sin through the blood of Christ. But as I said earlier, we are still struggling not to sin because we are still living in our sinful flesh and there is a constant war a struggle between knowing what god wants us to do and what our flesh wants to do apostle paul said in galatians 5 19 to 21 now the works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality impurity sensuality idolatry sorcery enmity strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So these things, my friends, are the desires of our flesh. Basically, Peter is saying that, you know, you are not of this world anymore. Okay? If, if before you used to harbor bitterness, before it is hard for you to forgive, it is hard for you to resist immoral things. 
now that you are a Christian, you should get away from those sinful desires. You are now children of God and citizens of heaven. Peter said, abstain uh, from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. You know the phrase wage war uh, is a term that means to carry out a long-term military campaign. It tells us that this war, the war between our flesh and spirit, will always be there as long as we are living in this fallen world. That is why we must never put our guards down. We should never be complacent because the moment we become relaxed and unmindful of this ongoing war inside of us, that's the time we lose. Brothers and sisters, we must intentionally pursue a holy life. If you want to live a life that glorifies God and draw peoples to Him, it must first start in our inner life. The crisis of this generation is that it is so attracted to the external that they don't pay attention to the internal anymore. We can post verses on our Facebook wall. We can talk about God, you know, do good to others, do good to people around us. But if our hearts are not right with God, if we are not pursuing holiness in our private life, it will soon manifest in our public life. The authenticity of our public testimony is best seen in our disposition. Brothers and sisters, pursue holiness in the Lord and abstain from sinful passions of our flesh by making Jesus the object of your satisfaction by fixing your eyes on him because if Jesus is not your ultimate joy or satisfaction in life you will look for other things you will fall into the passions of your flesh so first to be a living testimony for Jesus we should develop a holy life second we should demonstrate an honorable lifestyle an honorable lifestyle keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation when Apostle Peter wrote this he was well aware of the slander that the unbelievers are committing against the Christians you know first from the Emperor himself he accused the Christians of burning the city of Rome, which he himself did. Also, the Christians are accused for being evildoers, for rebelling against the Roman government because they are not bowing down to the emperor nor to their Roman gods. You see, they were also accused of cannibalism and incest. But Peter is telling the Christians to live the opposite way they are accused of. They must live an honorable life despite the slander and persecutions they are receiving. The word honorable means beautiful, attractively good, good that inspires an outward sign of the inward good. Christians are ought to live in a way that people will be attracted to our gospel message. We know our lives must echo the gospel that we proclaim. Unbelievers must see the beauty of Jesus in our lives. They must, they must feel the compassion of Jesus in us. They must experience the love of Jesus through us. They must see grace in action, truth live out in our lives. You know, when people look at you, when they observe your life, who do they see? What do they see? Feel. You know, I was uh, told a story about a man who used to be a song leader in their church. One day, while he was driving towards the uh, mall's parking lot, an old man and his grandson suddenly crossed the pedestrian lane. The driver did not see the old man crossing, but the good thing was that he was able to, to step on the brake. The old man and his grandson were safe. 
But the driver became so furious towards them that he got down from his car, shouted, and cursed at the old man. One Sunday, someone invited the old man to the church. And as he was singing the worship song, to his surprise, the song leader that day is no other than the driver who shouted and cursed at him last from last week. You know, thankfully, this song leader repented and is now faithfully serving God as a song leader and disciple in a local church. This story, however, should remind us of the importance of living an honorable life where, wherever we are and whoever we are with. Friends, when you are in their house, in your workplace, in your school, when you are driving on EDSA, when you are in the grocery, you know, when you are talking to a customer or waiter, do we reflect Jesus? Are they attracted to, to Jesus or they mock Jesus because of how we live our lives? When we live an honorable life among the unbelievers, we will have credibility. And effectiveness in sharing the gospel to them. May our lives echo the gospel we proclaim. Third, to become a living testimony for Jesus, we should demonstrate submission to civil authority. And it says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor or supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. In verse 11, Peter emphasized that as Christians, you know, we are just foreigners in this world and our citizenship is in heaven. Therefore, our ultimate submission belongs to our God. Yet, Peter clarified in this section that not because we are citizens of heaven, that we can be rebellious or disobedient to our earthly authorities. If you want to be a living testimony for Jesus, Peter is saying that we should submit to our earthly authorities, whom our God himself placed to govern over civil matters. Maybe some of you are, are asking, should we submit to government leaders who are corrupt, you know, or cursing leaders who are not leading well? Maybe Peter was just referring to good government leaders and not to evil ones. Interestingly, you know, both Apostle Peter and Paul address the Christians to submit to government authorities. Although both of them lived under the sinful, corrupt, Roman Empire. Yet you will not see a single message from them that says, you know, you know, re re rebel against the government or hold a protest against the emperor or stage a coup. There's no message from them like that. Instead, he called them to what? To submit. Paul said, let every person be subject, subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. Here, we can see that God commands and expects us to submit to civil authorities because first it is God who instituted them submission to government leaders is right because God appointed them to be in that position to submit to them is to acknowledge that God is sovereign over us over the affairs of the world and the kings and the presidents you know whether they acknowledge God or not they serve the purposes of God Second, it is for the Lord's sake. And it says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. We submit to glorify God. We submit because we acknowledge that we are in the position. They are in the position because of God's divine appointment. Do you find it hard to submit to earthly authorities, to our civil authorities? May this be your motivation that you are doing this for the Lord's sake. You know, Jesus, even though he was oppressed by the Jewish and Roman leaders, 
did not oppose their leadership. Jesus certainly rebuked the sins of the Jewish leaders, but he did not abolish their right to rule. Jesus did not lead a coup d'etat against the Roman Empire. In fact, he submitted himself even to the unjust judgment and death sentence of the Roman Empire. Why? Because Jesus was more concerned with the advancement of his kingdom than with the matters of the earthly kingdom. When our focus shifts from earthly affairs to heavenly ones, it will not be hard for us to submit to the earthly authority because we know that our king reigns supreme over the presidents and the rulers of this world. And we will be more concerned in the proclamation of the gospel and the expansion of God's kingdom. You know, I know some people who really love to watch the news. Uh, I myself like to be well aware of what's going on uh, around the world. But you know, sometimes we become too focused on the current events, right? That we are missing the purposes why we are here. And we are to focus on worldly affairs that we don't focus on the heavenly affairs anymore. You may be asking to, to Pastor, to what extent will I will I submit to the government authorities, to the civil authorities? You know, there is an exemption to this uh, to this kind of submission to them. When the gov go, gov government authorities or leaders commands us to do something that is contrary to the command of God, if they tell us to disobey God, then that's the time we don't obey them. Because again, our ultimate submission belongs to our true King, the Lord Jesus. Third, we should submit to them because it silences the ignorance of foolish people. And it says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. We are to submit because it is God's will for us to do the right thing. And what is that right thing? Which is to submit so that the mouth of those who oppose the gospel, those who criticize the gospel, may be stopped. Peter is saying that we should not allow the unbelievers to use our defiance towards authority as their basis to mock the gospel. When the government says we should pay our tax, we should pay our tax. Let us not go against it. Jesus said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. You see, we should be obedient to the civil authority and law. For example, if you are not yet a senior citizen or you are not a PWD, do not present a senior citizen or PWD ID to the counter just to get a discount. Such things are defiance and dishonesty. Do not allow such acts to let unbelievers mock the gospel. Instead, we should live as servants of God. Let us not use our spiritual freedom to not submit to the earthly authorities. Peter said, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. John MacArthur said, Freedom in Christ and citizenship in the kingdom of God in no way permit believers to abuse or disregard the standards of the conduct God has established for them on earth. Friends, let us act as a true citizen of the kingdom of God. May our lives cause the unbelievers to seek the God we worship and respond to the gospel we proclaim. A young salesman was disappointed about losing a big sale. And as he talked with his uh, sales manager, he lamented and he said, you know, I guess it's just pro it just proves you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can make him drink. The manager replied, your job is to not make him drink. Your job is to make him thirsty. So it is with our Christian life. Our lives 
should be so filled with Christ that they create a thirst for the gospel. As we hear the word of God today, what is our application point? You know, our passage provided for us the practical steps on how we can be a living testimony for Jesus. Peter summed up his teaching with these four practical applications. And he said, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. You want to be a living testimony for Jesus? Then remember these four things. First, honor everyone. What does it mean to honor everyone? During the time of Peter, not everyone is treated fairly, no, especially if you are not a Roman citizen. He is saying that we should not treat people based on their status, on their looks, race, color, or economic background. But everyone should be treated with respect. Sometimes it is tempting to look down on other people uh, because they are different from, from us. But Peter is saying that we should look at them as God's image bearer. Second, love the brotherhood or love our church family. We have to let the world see and know how we love our brothers and sisters in Christ genuinely. They must see that the body of Christ is living in harmony. For how can we preach the gospel of reconciliation to the world? if there is this unity and strife and unforgiveness in the body of Christ. The world must see that the members of the Church of Christ love one another. Third is to fear God. Fear God. Friends, to fear God means to revere Him, to respect Him, to love Him, to worship Him. To fear God is to also pursue holiness. The fear of God should propel us to live a life of holiness. If we fear God, we will not do the things that will offend God. Fourth is to honor the emperor, the president, the government leaders. The equivalent of the emperor in our modern world is the president. No matter who is seated in Malacanang, we should respect him, knowing that it is God who placed him there. Again, we are to submit to their leadership as long as he doesn't command us to disobey the Lord. We should continue to submit to Him. One of the best ways to honor the President is to pray for Him and the other leaders of the land as well. We should pray that God will open His heart to see and acknowledge the true King, Jesus Christ, and that He may lead well so that all of us, the nation, will live in peace. As we close, let me ask the question I asked at the start of the message. Is your life drawing people to the Lord or away from the Lord? You know, we only have a short time left in this world. Let's say 20, 30, 40 years. But how is your life making a difference to the lives of others, to the lives of unbelievers? Is your life making Jesus attractive to the unbelievers? It is my prayer that by God's grace, we will live a life that will glorify God and will draw people to Christ. Have a blessed Sunday, church family. Grace and peace to all of you.